talk a little bit about the things that I think people um, hesitate to see their lawyer about whenever they're thinking about their estate planning. I think that one of the reasons that people procrastinate and put off going to see their estate planning lawyer is that they overthink it or they they think that there's just so much that they don't know what to say and they uh, feel like they have to get all their plans made before they go in to see the lawyer, when if they would just go see the lawyer, they would find out that it's not nearly as complex as they thought it was going to be. Um, so I wanted to talk about the things that I would talk about with you if you came in and said, I, I think I need to make a will. Uh, I don't have anything. I'm not sure what I need to do. Um, and um, you uh, never made any kind of will or, or any kind of estate plan before. My name is Laura Hurd, and I'm an attorney who has been helping people with their estate planning and their probate needs since 1987. So for over 35 years here in San Antonio, Texas, I've been meeting with people, going over what they need, preparing their documents, and getting them set up with all the documents that they need. And Really, a lot of times they are surprised at how easy and simple the process is if they just come in and talk to me. First of all, <clears throat> the one thing that everybody needs is a will. And so you may be thinking, why do I need a will if I want to avoid probate? Um, or I, I want to maybe think about a living trust because I've heard about living trust to avoid probate. The reality is everyone who has a living trust needs to have a will also because most people don't avoid probate completely with a living trust. That's a big shock. <laughs> but if you have a trust, you have to put all of your property in the trust. And a lot of times people forget something. They leave something out or something that uh, just slipped their mind or they never got around to putting in the trust. And so when they pass away, that property doesn't belong to the trust. It belongs to the estate. And the only way for the heirs or the beneficiaries to get that property is they have to probate a will. And so um, there is always or there should always be a pour over will, they call them, that says, um, if I have any property that I own at the time of my death, I give it to my trust after I die. I ran into recently someone who had a living trust done that they didn't even get a will with the trust. And that's very unusual. Usually any estate planning lawyer who does trust would know that you need to do a, a will along with that trust. But if you um, don't have a real large estate and um, you just want to have the will without the trust, um, along with the will, there are several other documents you need to consider. But when you come in to talk about the will, mainly I just need to know in general who you want to leave your property to. For a lot of people, they want to leave everything to their spouse, and then if their spouse and them die at the same time or their spouse dies before them, then everything equally to their children. And, and it can be stated as simply as that. You don't have to list every piece of property that you own. If you have specific things that you particularly want someone to have, like you've got a, a special piece of jewelry that you want your daughter to have and a piece of art that you know that your son has always admired and you want to make sure your son gets your, your you know, his dad's things. Um those kind of things, we can list them specifically in the will, but you don't want to do too much of that because a lot of times those wills don't get probated until 20, 30 years later, and those items have disappeared or already been given away. And then it causes a lot of hard feelings of somebody thinking they've been stolen or what happened to them. Or I was supposed to get this and I never did. Um, so you don't want to list too many specific things in the will. Um, and the more property you give away specifically, the less you have to be divided equally between the children. So um, 
I've seen some people that plan out everything so much. They've given the house away. They've given the bank account away. They've given away their retirement. There's nothing left for the, the executor to use for estate expenses. There are some expenses that are going to have to come out off the top. And if you have any creditors when you die, they have to be paid off the top. And so what they end up doing is they have to end up selling something that you had specifically given to somebody else because those things have to be taken care of first and they needed some cash. Um, so that causes a lot of problems. So the best thing to do is just to say, whatever I've got after the state is settled, it goes equally to my three children or, you know, to my um children if they survive me and to my grandchildren if they don't survive me, that kind of thing. Uh, your lawyer could help you with the wording of that, but mainly we just need the names. So who are the names of your children? What's the name of your spouse? Or is there another person that you want to leave something to? And then we need to know um, who you want to be guardian for your minor children. If you have minor children, you can split that up and have a guardian of the person who makes sure that they have a place to live and that they're taken care of, and a guardian of the estate who manages the property until the children become of age and they can manage their own property. Um, and so the guardian of the person, the guardian of the estate, can be two different people or they can be the same person. And they can be different or the same from your executor. A lot of times it's simplest to make the executor the person who handles all of that. They handle any trust that's in the will. They handle the uh, guardianship of the children. They handle the the settling of the estate. But sometimes people have you know preferences of who they want to do one thing or another. Or they think one person's better at handling finances and another person's better at handling the children. Um, and so you can split that up however you want. Um, but we need the names of, of those people that you would want to be in charge of the estate, that's your executor, and the person that you would want to be in charge of making sure that your children, minor children, are taken care of until they become adults. And between the two of those, um, you you want to think about um, also uh, an alternate because in case the person that you have named doesn't um, survive you or they refuse to do it or they're not able to do it for some reason, then you need an alternate person named um, just in case. And um, keep in mind that for most of those things that involve handling money, the, the person in charge of the estate, the person in charge of a uh, guardian for the children's money, they can't be a convicted felon. Um, so if you know that, you know, the person you had in mind was a convicted felon, even though you think they were innocent or they've changed or they've, you know, they're a different person now, still the law says that they can't be in charge because they had that felony record. Along with your will, though, you also need some powers of attorney. Everybody really needs to have two powers of attorney, one for medical decisions and one for um, financial decisions. And the reason for that is a will does not take effect until you die, but the powers of attorney are no longer in force once you die. So the powers of attorney are for while you're still alive and the will is for after you die. Your powers of attorney, are you naming somebody to manage your property or to take care of your health needs if you weren't able to do it yourself? Um, but they have to do it for your benefit and according to how you want it done. And you can be very general or you can be very specific in these documents. You can customize them as to what power you want that person to have. Um, the agent that you've named, what, what kinds of things you want them to be able to do or not able to do. For instance, um, in the statutory uh, financial power of attorney, you might want them to have the power to buy and sell real estate, or you might want to say, well, I want them to handle my bank accounts in case I couldn't pay my bills. I want them to have the power to um, handle any lawsuits that might be pending on my behalf. I want them to have the power to manage my business. And I want them to have the power to um, 
make sure that I have a place to live and, you know, that my bills get paid, but I don't want them to have the power to sell my real estate. So you can, you can customize that, or you can just say anything that I could do with my property, they can do with my property. I trust them to be looking out for my best interest. Um, and um, really you should trust them pretty well if you're going to name them as agent, because that gives them a lot of power. And um, I always suggest that you go ahead and make it effective immediately. You can have that power of attorney effective um, immediately or effective only when a doctor declares that you're unable to make your own decisions. Problem is, if you put it off till you're unable to make your own decisions, then you won't be in a position to um, do anything about it if it turns out the person you named is not doing it the way you wanted them to. And, you know, it, you definitely need it to be somebody that you really, really trust. If you really, really trust them, why not go ahead and give them that power now? You trust that they're not going to use it until the time is right. And in the meantime, if you do find out that they are stealing your money behind your back, then you still have the capability of stopping it, of revoking that power of attorney, of, of um catching what they're doing uh, before it's too late. So I always suggest go ahead and make it effective now. And then they don't have to jump through hoops of trying to prove that you're incompetent whenever the time comes that they really need to use it. And um, the medical power of attorney is um, along those lines, you've given someone the right to make healthcare decisions for you. And again, they're supposed to do it for your benefit and also according to how you would want it done, not necessarily what they think is best for you. So, for instance, um, if you felt that you did not want to be kept alive on artificial life support and you had expressed that to them and they know that's what you want, then they're obligated to carry that out even if they personally feel that that's immoral or that, that you know, they should... Um, keep you alive at all costs, no matter what. Um, so they're supposed to do what you would have wanted done if you were able to communicate. And we're not allowed to combine the two. They have to be two separate documents. The um, medical power of attorney is separate from the financial power of attorney, but you can name the same person as agent in both if you wish, or you can name different people. Uh, sometimes people have uh, a child who has an adult child who has some medical training, a doctor or a nurse, and they want that person to be in charge of their health care, but they want somebody else to be in charge of their finances. And sometimes people pick, you know, the oldest child is the first one and the second oldest is the alternate and the third oldest is the second alternate. Along with those things, I often, um, will prepare for people a HIPAA release. HIPAA is that law that protects your privacy, that the doctors are always having to discuss with you or have you sign a paper about or you know notify you of whenever you go to see your doctor for the first time. Um, it tells you that um, you know they are not going to release your information to other people unless they have your express permission. And um, a lot of times we assume that the doctor will talk to the family, is going to talk to the children or the spouse of the person who's in the hospital. But that's not always the case. Uh, generally, the doctors are only supposed to do that if they have the consent of the patient. If the patient doesn't consent or can't communicate, then you may be in a position where the doctors won't tell you anything about what's going on with that, that person health-wise. And so the HIPAA release doesn't give any decision-making power. It just allows the, um, the doctors to talk to the family or the person that you've named about what's going on with you medically, what's your prognosis, what's your diagnosis, um, and, you know, what, what they have found out. So um, you, you can, share that information with everybody, even though not everybody has the right to actually make a decision or do anything about it. Um, so there's, there's four documents that we've discussed already that 
nearly everybody needs, the will, the two powers of attorney, and the HIPAA release. Um, there's also something called a designation of guardian, a self-designation of guardian. Now, guardianship is something that is um, is not ideal. You don't really want to have a guardianship, but sometimes you just can't help it. Sometimes it's unavoidable. Um, a guardianship is somebody who has uh, been appointed by the court to make decisions for you because you're not able to make your own decisions. And in order to do that, they have to actually file a lawsuit have you served with a process server? Have an attorney appointed to represent you as well as the attorney who's representing the proposed guardian? And they have to have a doctor's report that's fairly recent, and they have to put on evidence and have the doctor testify as to what you can and cannot do, why you're not able to handle your own affairs. And the, the court has to actually find you incompetent before they appoint a guardian. Then the guardian has to put up a bond. The guardian has to appoint, uh, has to um, be audited and report to the court annually, at least. Um, and so there's a lot of court proceedings, a lot of expense, a lot of hassle and time and money involved in becoming a guardian and in managing a guardianship. And so, you know, if you can avoid that with the power of attorney, that's one reason we do the powers of attorney is that hopefully we can avoid having to do a guardianship if we can use those powers of attorney. The problem with powers of attorney, the financial powers of attorney, the person you're dealing with, the doing business with, or the bank, they don't have to accept the power of attorney legally. They don't have to accept it. And so um, recently they've, they've come out and said, if you write your power of attorney a certain way that complies with this statute, then if the bank is going to turn it down, they have to tell you why. They have to give you a reason why they're not accepting it. Um, but other than that, you know, they still, you know, can find some fault in it and say, um, we don't trust it. We, we want you to get a court order before we're going to do anything. And so then you have to get a guardianship. <clears throat> And um, so if, if there is a need for a guardianship, some people feel very strongly about certain people that they don't want to be their guardian. And you have to think about, you know, what if I was unable to communicate, if I was in a coma, or if I was, you know, so far gone with Alzheimer's or dementia that I could not communicate that I do not want this person to ever be my guardian. Maybe that they've abused you in the past and nobody knows it or um, that they have stolen from you or that they're, you know, they have an addiction that um, you do not want um, them to be in charge of handling your affairs. And so the self-designation of guardian is a document where you um, yourself decide who you want to be your guardian if one is ever needed. You don't, you're not appointing the guardian. You may not ever get a guardian, but you're just saying, I want, this person is my first choice. This person is my alternate choice. I don't want that person to ever be my guardian. And so if you make those instructions to the court, the court will give that priority. And, and as long as that person is otherwise qualified under the law, they're going to appoint the person that you've chosen. And that's a pretty simple document. Another thing that most people should consider having is an agent to control the disposition of their remains. Now, that's a fancy title for a fairly simple document that says, this is the person who's going to take care of my body after I die. And the reason that's important is if you want to get cremated, it seems these days that a majority of people do feel that cremation is a better choice. It's um, it's cheaper. It's um, it's a lot less expensive than a traditional burial. Um, but um, the law kind of tends to assume that you don't want to be cremated. And there's some hoops that they have to jump through, and sometimes families fight over it. I've seen all kinds of lawsuits over whether somebody's going to get cremated or not. 
And so the agent to control remains is you designating somebody who's going to be in charge of making sure that your body's taken care of. And they're going to be the person who um, has made sure that um, you get cremated if that's your choice. So if you do want to get cremated, it's really important to have this document. If you don't want to get cremated, um, then the traditional burial is probably what will take place. Uh, or if you don't care one way or the other, that then you don't need to make that designation of what's going to happen to your body. But if you name the person who's in charge, at least there's no wondering, um, you know, after you've gone, nobody to fight over it or, or to decide who's in charge. So I'm doing this live. If you have any questions and you're listening to this right now, then you can go ahead and, you know, pop your questions into the chat um, or put them up, up so that um, I can answer them as we go along. Um, so I have uh, talked about wills. I've talked about two powers of attorney, a HIPAA release, uh, agent to control remains. And um, I've talked about the self-designation of guardian. That's six documents. Uh, there's some other optional ones. Um, if you haven't put on your driver's license, whether you want to make an anatomical gift, your lawyer can do a document for you to make an anatomical gift or you know, to donate your body to science or state that you want your body to be used um, for medical research or whatever. Um, and then there's also a document that you could do called a directive to physicians. Now, the directive to physicians has a, some overlap with your medical power of attorney. A lot of times people just go with the medical power of attorney and that takes care of it. But the directive to physicians is you telling the doctor yourself directly that you don't want to be kept alive on artificial life support. And you can be very specific about what kinds of treatments you want, what kinds of treatments you don't want. You can customize that. Um, and so um, it's only effective if you are in a terminal condition or you're not expected to live if they remove the life support. You, there's nothing that we can do that would hurry your death along. If you know, we still don't have legal euthanasia, so it's not you know like, well, if I'm in pain, I want them to go ahead and you know do me in, kill me. They can't kill you, but they can remove the life support that's keeping you alive. And um, so the directive to physicians. Um, is something that federal law says that the doctors must honor. They cannot override it. Uh, if you have uh, ahead of time done this directive to physicians and told the doctors what kind of treatment you want, what kind of treatment you don't want, if you were in a terminal condition, then uh, they have to honor that directive to physicians. So that takes the decision out of the hands of your loved ones. Your loved ones don't have to agonize over whether that's the right decision or not when the time comes. But if you, on the other hand, think, you know, there's too many variables here. There's too many different kinds of things that could be happening. And, you know, I don't know what medical science is going to do in the future. I don't know exactly what kind of situation I might be in. So I want my loved one to make that decision based on the facts at the time. I want somebody to have the discretion to say yes or no based on what the doctors are saying and what the conditions are and what the, the risks and the, and the um, uh, prognosis is. So your medical power of attorney, the person you've named as your agent in that, does have the right to make that decision as well. But if you um, have both a medical power of attorney and a directive to physicians, the directive to physicians controls on that one issue. Your medical power of attorney is much more broad. It contr controls things um, that have nothing to do with life and death. It can be any kind of medical treatment. It could be putting you in rehab or nursing home or deciding whether or not to mend your broken leg or to, you know, operate for uh elective procedure or whatever. Um, so it, it could be any kind of medical procedure that your agent is consenting on your behalf in a medical power of attorney. But the um, agent to control, I mean, the, the um, directive to physicians is specifically only 
uh, that life and death decision of whether to keep you on artificial life support. And it is a good idea um, to also do some pre-need planning with um, a funeral home um, and, you know, talk with maybe a crematorium. If, if you want to be cremated, um, pay in advance or at least sign documents there um, to make it clear what your wishes are regarding your burial or your ashes, um, maybe buy your burial plot ahead of time. They say that the, the costs of burial um, skyrocket every year. They, they just keep going up and up and up. And so anything you could do to freeze that cost um, or to pay for it over time will take a lot of stress off of your loved ones. Um, you know, imagine they've just lost you. They're, they're mourning. They're, they're um, very sad. And they have all these decisions they have to make in a short period of time about what to do about your burial. It would be so much easier for them if you've already laid it out and said what you want, made some choices, you know, maybe picked out your coffin or um, put some money down and, and um, picked out the place that you want your service to be held at. Um, so that's the kind of thing that if you go talk to a funeral home, they can help you with that pre-need planning to make things easier for your loved ones. All of those things your attorney can talk to you about when you come in and plan your documents um, and you decide which documents you want, which ones you don't want, who you want to be in charge. And then your attorney will prepare those documents later and then you'll come back and sign the documents with witnesses and a notary later. Now, if you want to avoid probate and you want to have a living trust, you still need all of those documents I just talked about. None of those are eliminated by, by your living trust. Um, when you do a living trust, typically you do a will, two powers of attorney, a HIPAA release, directive to physicians, anatomical gifts, all of that stuff at the same time that you're doing your trust. Um, your living trust document is um, a, a much longer document that says um, how your property is going to be handled, who's going to be in charge. And people kind of have, um, I think, some idea that a trust is this mysterious thing that the bank is going to handle or something. Really, a trust can be as simple as a checking account. Um, it could be your trustee just opens a checking account, puts the money in there, and they write the, the checks out of that account. But that account is not to be mixed up with their personal money. It has to be kept separate because that is the trust account. And it's only used for the purposes of the trust. And the trust terms control how it can be used, when the money can be spent, what it can be spent on. And so um, you'll have a trust document. But the trust is only as good as the property that you have put into the trust. And in order to do that, there is a lot of documentation. Um, for instance, if you want your house to belong to the trust, well, you have to do a deed. Um, and if you want your bank account to be in the trust, you've got to change the name on the bank account, the ownership down at the bank. You've got to change your brokerage accounts. You've got to change your car titles uh, by filling out forms at the um, tax assessor or the Department of Motor Vehicles and get a new car title that's in the name of the trust. The trust name would be the owner of the car title. The trust name would be the owner of the bank account. The trust would be the name of the owner of the real estate, however much real estate you own. All of those things, your 401k beneficiaries, your life insurance beneficiaries, um, if you want that to belong to the trust, you have to sign documents to get that turned over. And that's where a lot of people um, don't get the support that they need. Um, whenever I do a living trust, I try to really help people make sure that they get that property put in the trust name. And that includes drafting a deed, having the deed signed before a notary, having the deed recorded down at the county deed records. Um, because if you don't do that, then that property is not in the trust and you're going to have to probate the will when the time comes because it, it does not avoid probate if it's not in the trust. So you're going to have a whole slew of other documents that go along with the trust 
in addition to those documents I just talked about. So there's a whole lot of documents to talk about, but um, your attorney can explain each one to you. You decide which ones that you want and um, the attorney drafts them. And like I said, mainly the attorney just needs to know the names of the people you want to be in charge and who you want your property to go to. And then the rest of it, all the rest of that verbiage that the attorney takes care of. When you come back, the attorney will explain to you anything you don't understand in the written documents. You know, you should read them, make sure you understand them if you don't. If you have questions um, or if you're not sure about something, you know, get it changed before you sign it. But um, that can ge generally be done in the office while you're there. And uh, then you sign it and then you have all of this taken care of. So I don't see any questions that have come in. Um, but I hope this has been beneficial because I mean, this is more or less just what I would say to you if you came into the office to talk to me. Um, I would put it in writing, you know, if you need it to be in writing. Um, if you need to go think about it, you can certainly do that or talk to your spouse or your children about it. Uh, but um, those, that's the list of documents that we would be considering for you. And we don't have to do them all at the same time. We could start with just doing the will and do the powers of attorney later or um, do um, some of them. Usually what we like to do is have the husband and wife come in at the same time and do all of these at the same time, just get it over with. It's a lot of signing, but you got your two witnesses, you got your notary. And, you know, when it's done, it's done. You know, it takes an hour or so, and then it's all taken care of. Suppose you have to make another trip to come back, and things might happen, and you might not ever make it back. So, um, again, my name is Laura Hurd, and I have an office here in San Antonio, Texas. I have a website, and I am on TikTok and all the social media platforms. And um, I'd be happy if you um, would like to call and, and um, talk with me more about these different documents. So I think I'm going to sign off now. Um, this is my first experience doing a live uh, video, and I hope that it's been helpful to you. I do. I did. I'm done. Come see me. <laughs>